So welcome everyone. Today is also the appearance day of Bhagavad Gita. This is the day that Lord Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita. So during my meditation, I was trying to understand the message of Lord Kapila Dev and the message of Lord Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita and note some comparison. One big one was that in Bhagavad Gita, one of the main themes is that we should become detached from these, this material world means not so overwhelmed by the illusion and temporary nature of it, but become more attracted to the spiritual self and the Supreme Personality of God in his pastimes and activities and world in which he lives in. And if you've noted during our reading of these pastimes, just kind of hinting because we haven't gotten to the teachings yet, but one of the main teachings that Lord Kapiladev also taught was the fundamentals of material nature and understanding that temporary illusory nature of it, as opposed to or compared to the eternal truth of the spiritual world, the Lord, our spiritual self as an eternal entity, and becoming more absorbed in that aspect of our lives rather than the temporary flow of the modes of material nature. So with that in mind, we'll also see how Devahuti experienced after so much pleasure in the aerial mansion for years and years together with Kardamamuni, how oh, even after such enjoyment, still she wasn't satisfied. So let us now uh, switch over to the texts that we, that we studied. This is the weekly review for November 2022. 2022 lessons seven and eight. And I'll, I'll, I'll read these first ones. Tisha is going to help call on people. Samapriya is not feeling well today, so she's not going to be speaking on the Zoom. But uh, Tisha will keep track of everyone that's reading and, and call you out. But to begin, because last week uh, we didn't, there was some technical difficulty and we didn't get to meet. So therefore, I did a slight review where these verses will kind of bring everybody's mind to where we are in the narrative. This is Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, 23rd chapter, texts 45 through 50, which is the end of, uh, uh, the end of that section that we had studied previously. In that aerial mansion, Devahuti in the company of her handsome husband, situated on an excellent bed that increased sexual desires, could not realize how much time was passing. Uh, what, we having trouble that? getting on. The other people are having trouble. Are there a lot of people on? There's some. Certainly. Uh, just a minute. People are having trouble getting on. Uh, the address is there. The Zoom is open. I had also trouble getting on. So what's in my inventory? Try it again. On the Put in the numbers that are on the meeting ID. Okay. And the and the, and the password is the same, eighteen ninety six. Oh yeah. Oh, put in the numbers. Okay, I'll start again. I guess some devotees are trying to get on and they can't. In that aerial mansion, Devahuti, in the company of her handsome husband, situated on an excellent bed that increased sexual desires, could not realize how much time was passing, while the cupper couple who eagerly longed for sexual pleasure with us and with us enjoying themselves by virtue of mystic powers, a hundred autumns passed like a brief span of time. The powerful Kardamamuni was the knower of everyone's heart, and he could grant whatever one desired. Knowing the spiritual soul, he regarded her as half his body. Dividing himself into nine forms, he impregnated Devahuti with nine discharges of semen. Immediately afterward, on that same day, Devahuti gave birth to nine female children, all charming in every limb and fragrant with the scent of the red lotus flower. When she saw her husband about to leave home, she smiled externally, but at heart, she was agitated and distressed. She stood and scratched the ground with her foot which was radiant with the luster of her gem-like nails. Her head bent down. She spoke in slow, yet charming accents, 
suppressing her tears. So where are we starting with, Tisha? Hari Bowl, everyone. Amrita is first. Okay. Hare Krishna. Sri Devahuti said, my Lord, you have fulfilled all the promises you gave me. Yet because I am your surrendered soul, you should give me fearlessness too. Sri Prabhupada's purport. Material existence is always fearful and full of anxiety. Devahuti is saying, all sorts of material comforts by your yogic power. And since you are now prepared to go away, you must give me your last reward so that I might get free from this material conditional life. Anything you want to add, Amrita, to that? Yeah, I'm just glad that, because um, I was hearing the text, uh, chapter 22, and I was hearing Carter Mamuni saying that after he gave her a child, he was going to leave. And I was this morning thinking, how is this appropriate to give to get, have a woman raise a child by herself and um, just to give her a child and leave? But somehow that he spent so much time with her, I feel a little bit better because no one wants to be a single mother, right? Like, and now she's in that situation. So I guess I still have that same question. Good question. Excellent question. Uh, if you read the purports carefully, it's not that he—it's not that he left. He did leave immediately, but you will will realize what that means in the in, in a different, little bit different context. Because Karta Mamuni will speak with Kapila Dave. If Kapila was just a little baby, then they couldn't have a coherent conversation in, in depth. So obviously, Kapila Dave was just like these daughters were born immediately on the same day. Kapila, when Kardama finally left home, was a grown individual and he will instruct his mother. So in those purports, it was describing how in a Vedic system, the grown up sons mm -hmm. take care of the, of the mother when the father uh, renounces the family life. It's a little little more detail of, of what's mm -hmm. about to happen and what the Vedic concept is. It's not that any woman should be left alone with her children, according to a perfect Vedic system, which in Satya Yuga at the time of the Prajapatis is basically what we're dealing with. We're dealing with pretty, per pretty perfect situations, mm -hmm. flying around in aerial mansions, giving birth on the same day that you're impregnated <laughs> to nine people, right. with nine, nine expansions of your husband. It's unusual. So similarly, she will be totally satisfied with, with Kapila, the Supreme Lord, as her protector and provider at that time. But good, good point that she's fearful that he's going to leave and leave her like that. So good insight. Next, Tisha. Next is, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm not I can't remember your spiritual name, but Michael. Sham, Sham Govinda, you're next. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, so just reading this slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I just came in. <clears throat> My dear Brahman, as far as your daughters are concerned, they will find their own suitable husbands and go away to their respective homes. But who will give me solace after your departure as a sannyasi? Purport. Relief does not mean material comforts. Material comforts will end with the end of the body. But spiritual instruction will not end. It will go on, on with the spirit soul. Instruction in spiritual advancement is necessary, but without having a worthy son, how could Devahuti advance in spiritual knowledge? It is the duty of the husband to liquidate his debt to his wife. The wife gives her sincere service to the husband, and he becomes indebted to her because one cannot accept service from his subordinate without giving him something in exchange. The spiritual master cannot accept service from a disciple without awarding him spiritual instruction. That is the reciprocation of love and duty. Thus, Devahuti reminds her husband, Karamamuni, that she has rendered him faithful service. Even considering the situation on the basis of liquidating his debt towards his wife, toward his wife, he must give a male child before he leaves. 
Indirectly, Devahuti requests her husband to remain at home a few days more, or at least until a male child is born. So, Sham Govinda, there's there's a, a, a few different points, a couple that stand out to me. One is that relief from fearfulness does not mean material comforts, because everyone knows that they won't last, no matter how comfortable we make ourselves. We've all experienced that that won't last. And secondly, the spiritual master, not only the husband, but the spiritual master cannot accept service from a disciple without awarding him spiritual instruction. Hmm. That is a reciprocation of love and duty. So Sham Govinda, tell us a little bit about your realizations with love and duty and the reciprocation that manifests from those two uh, characteristics. Well, I guess both have to be there, as the text says. Um, my own realization is that um, it's difficult because it's like when one goes to school, like I'm going to school, you often have to draw down a, a loan before, before you can repay. And so that's my realization. I'm, uh, I'm drawing down from my spiritual master and um, his God brothers and God sisters until such time that I have the qualities to repay him. And what about from his side? He's always giving. <clears throat> I just, well, I just write, I just write the spiritual loan request, and it comes through the next day. Anyone else? Uh, it, it, it's a, it's, a, it's a dynamic that is meant to help both of them. The spiritual master has a mission in his service to the Lord. And we see with Srila Prabhupada, at least, he was very um, appreciative. Some of his lectures even chokes up saying thank you for helping, for his disciples, helping him carry out his service for his spiritual master. And like you, like you pointed out, at the same time, the disciples never really feel uh, that he owes them anything. They feel totally obliged to them. But that dynamic basically helps us understand also our relationship with the Supreme Lord, that we're receiving so many things, but at the same time, we're also serving constantly. And the more one serves, we see that uh, we just had the Kartik Vrat a couple months ago. And that one verse said, uh, those super excellent pastimes of Lord Krishna's babyhood drown the inhabitants of Gokul in pools of ecstasy. To the devotees who are attracted only to the majestic aspect of the Lord in Nar of Narayan and Vaikuntha, the Lord herein reveals, I am conquered and overwhelmed by pure loving devotion. The comments on that particular verse and concept are that, that that's one of the highest aspects of God, that uh, how can the Supreme Person be controlled by anything? He's completely independent, bigger and more powerful than anyone, yet it's his nature to become overwhelmed by the love of his devotees and actually become subordinate to them as he did with Mother, Mother Yasoda and allowed himself to be bound. So that dynamic of love and duty uh, is an important one that we'll continue to read throughout everything that we study. Thank you. Next. Next is me. Okay, give me a sec. <clears throat> Shiva Bhagavatam 3, 23, verse 53 and 54. Until now, we have simply wasted so much of our time in sense gratification, neglecting to cultivate knowledge of the Supreme Lord. Not knowing your transcendental situation, I have loved you while remaining attached to the objects of the senses. Nonetheless, let the affinity I have developed for you rid me of all fear. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. So in effect, Devahuti said to her husband, so far we have these daughters and we have enjoyed material life in the aerial mansion traveling all over the universe. These boons have come by your grace, 
but they have all been for sense gratification. Now there must be something for my spiritual advancement. Oops. In Sorry. Chaitanya. Oh, that's okay. In Chaitanya Charitamrita, Lord Chaitanya says that Sadhu, Sadhu Sangha, the association of great saintly person, is very important because even if one is not advanced in knowledge, simply by association with a great saintly person, one can immediately make considerable advancement in spiritual life. As a woman, as an ordinary wife, Devahuti became attached to Kardamamuni in order to satisfy her sense enjoyment and other material necessities. But actually, she associated with the great personality. Now she understood this, and she wanted to utilize the advantage of the association of her great husband. Do you want to share your realizations about it? Um, I just remember reading this and this about the Sadhu Sangha and the association of um, devotees and people and for me in my life just you know having uh, read the Srimad Bhagavatam completely um, over the years there's just a enormous difference you can't even imagine just reading a book and that but and then studying a book with people who can guide you and teach you it and then you understand and it's like a whole different uh, situation and so I'm so grateful. There really is a huge difference of my understanding from just reading on my own compared to having the association of all of you and reading the forums or seeing you. So I am a perfect example of the benefit of um, Sadhu Sangha. Ah. I, th I think also part of it is that, that these books are, are not material books. They're actually spoken by the Lord. They're, they're incarnations, literary incarnations. So, and, you know, how they call living scripture, even, even, the, even the Christians and other, other um, sects um, know that there's something about spiritual literature that's different. So when more people get involved, seeing it from slightly different points of view or understanding one aspect of it more than others and sharing that, it opens up everybody to a, a wider Mm -hmm. understanding and bigger point of view than we have when we when we read it it's almost like reading it through a straw you kind of just see the world in that one little area that you're looking at but when you are in the association of others it opens it up so the same things happen with devahuti she's seen the whole universe she traveled around enjoying everything but she's actually realizing now after all those experiences that her husband is really an advanced soul so she wants something of that from him, not just more material things. Yeah. Next. Next is Kate. Hare Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam 3, 2355. Association for sense gratification is certainly the path of bondage, but the same type of association performed with a saintly person leads to the path of liberation, even if performed without knowledge. The association of a saintly person in any way, in any way bears the same result. For example, Lord Krishna met many kinds of living entities and treated him as an enemy, and some treated him as an agent for sense gratification. It is generally said that the gopis were, attra were attached to Krishna for sense attractions, and yet they became first-class devotees of the Lord. Kamsa, Shishupal, Dantavarka, and other demons, however, were related to Krishna as enemies. But whenever they associated with Krishna as enemies for, or for sense gratification, out of fear or as pure devotees, they all got liberation. That is the end result of association with the Lord. Even if one does not understand who he is, the results have the same efficacy. Association with a great saintly person also results in liberation, just as whether one goes toward fire knowingly or unknowingly, the fire will make one warm. Devahuti expressed her gratefulness for although she wanted to associate with Kardamamuni only for sense gratification, because he was spiritually great, she was sure to be liberated by his benediction. 
Yeah, so can you share something with on that uh, topic, Kate? Um, well, yeah, it's, it's uh, like T Tish was saying, um, you know, understanding Devahuti, under, she understood all this, all this material sense gratification, these wonderful things that they had, but because he was saintly, only because of that, um, that fact was she want, desiring more, right? Because she had, he had great spiritual liberation. It's almost as if we need to have that contact with the saintly person or in order to even know, you know, we want it or it exists or, you know, get a little tiny taste of it. Hi, thank you. Some devotees are having trouble getting on because we have a new address. So I'm kind of, I got a few different plates on the items on the plate that I'm dealing with. Um, thank you, Kate. Yes, association is such an important feature of everyone's life. What does it say in Bhagavad Gita about association with the three modes of material nature, Kate? Um, we can become contaminated with them. Yes, the conditioned soul, no matter what happens, it, we're so small that as soon as the as soon as the living entity comes in contact with this material nature, immediately we start to become conditioned by it. Can you give an example in your own life where you can see how coming in contact with something, staying in its association for some time, gradually affected you to the point where it became, you know, you could you could really see that you'd either become that you'd become bound and attached to it. Um yeah. I mean as a householder in family life, isn't that if only we could think of service to the Lord the way we think of service to our our family and the, and our duties as as my son is screaming out there. Um, <laughs> Only we could have that spontaneous um, attachment to to the Lord and to service the way we are just so bound by these um, by the three modes, right? We're so in the mode of passion. We want to provide for our family. We want to uh, we want to succeed. We want our family to succeed. It's but when you when you step back and reflect, that's all mode of passion, right? Mode of you know wanting more. It's all material <laughs> things. Exactly. And, and even our identification of ourselves and who they are is based on the illusion of the body and the false ego. And it's a, it's a whole network of entanglement. So what is Devahuti saying to Kardama in this, in this regard? She's fed up. She's seen it. You know, she has everything. She has mansion. She has an aerial mansion. She's begging for, you know, a little bit of spiritual and uh, liberation yes exactly enough enough of this sense gratification traveling around enjoying the the heavenly areas that we went to and the sex that we've enjoyed now i'm interested in something more sean govinda um uh okay okay uh Oh yeah, Amon. So what I was thinking was, what is you said? What is Krishna saying in Bhagavad Gita about the three modes of nature? He says, rise above the three modes of nature oh, in the second nice. chapter. Yeah. How do we do that? <laughs> um, from what I know, just follow the process of chanting Hare Krishna and um, absorbing our mind in Krishna's service. So all the senses. The intelligence, the mind, and Krishna's service, somehow or other, whatever is needed and whatever suits a particular situation. So how does that help? How, how does that produce an effect that's any different than if we're acting normally? We're still under, we act, are we not still under the modes of nature? Uh, it depends on the, where our consciousness is focused. So if we act in the material modes of nature, there'll be a reaction. Whereas if we act... On the platform of Krishna consciousness, even though we might be in the material energy, because it's for Krishna, 
and Krishna sees it and accepts it, it becomes spiritualized. I'm going to ask you to look up a verse while I ask Amrita to yes. say what she's saying. Look up 715 Bhagavad Gita and then we'll read that together. So in the Bhagavad Gita in chapter 17, but I'll hold on. Cecilia had her hand up for a long time, so I feel like she should oh, be. I'll, okay. just, I'll just quickly say, Krishna is telling us how to behave in the mode of goodness. And we're hearing all over that he wants us to get to that point. So how, you know, like our, our the mode of goodness in the mind is to be satisfied. The mode of goodness with the tongue is to not speak harshly, to speak the truth, not to instruct someone who's not our student, who's not able to take it. Um, let's see. For the body, the mode of goodness is to like not have sex outside of marriage. There's all this. I just wish I could remember it. It's in chapter 17. I'm trying to find it. But he's telling us how to behave in the mode of goodness because he okay. wants I'm, us to I'm, be. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hope that we can even rise above the mode of goodness and get to transcendence. Take but we can't mind. do that until we get to the mode of goodness, right? Because there's right? so much sure. in the mode of passion. And ignorance. So what I'm hearing is like, we got to get to that point. And then from there, by chance. Well, actually, can... actually, it can happen in a moment. Uh, but I'm not. That's true. But like somehow it's not happening in a moment for me. <laughs> so, well, it, sometimes it might not appear so. We'll get back to um, Sham Govinda's verse that he's looking up, and when we do that, that will yes. that will help. Oh, you got it? Seven fifteen. Okay. I'll ahead, just read please. the English translation for time. Yes. Those miscreants who are grossly foolish, who are lowest among men, mankind, whose knowledge is stolen by illusion, and who partake of the atheistic nature of demons, do not surrender unto me. Okay, that's not the one I thought that, that was the number. I'm going to have to look it up for a second. Is it 714? Is it three modes of material nature uh, difficult to overcome? Yes, that one. Oh, uh, that's 14. Okay, 714. So what is the English for that one? Uh, um, let me just go back one verse. Sorry. Okay. This divine energy of mind consisting of the three modes of material nature is difficult to overcome. But those who have surrendered unto me can easily cross beyond it. Wonderful. So Amrita, when Arjuna was fighting on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, one could say he was in the mode of passion because that activity definitely employs passionate energy. But Krishna is saying, again, Sham Govinda, English, the divine energy of mind, uh, unmute. Unmute, Prabhu. Sham Govinda, you're muted. Sorry. This divine energy of mind consisting of the three modes of material nature is difficult to overcome, but those who surrender to me can easily cross beyond it. So the point is in Bhagavad Gita that although the modes of material nature the divine energy, it's, it's, it's more powerful than any living entity. But if one surrenders to the instruction of Krishna and dovetails, if, we, if the living entity dovetails his will to the will of the Supreme Lord, then no matter what he or she or th that living entity does in this material world is transcendental. That's the example of the iron in the fire. The problem comes is that our hearts act with mixed motivations, something for Krishna, and there's something for ourselves. And that continues to bind us. But the practice of that gradually releases us. Chetamayi, did you uh, have anything to say? Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Yeah. I had a question about uh, Deva Kuti's consciousness about Kardama Muni's advancement. As a, as a spiritual uh, instructor, when she first uh, became interested in him as a, as a partner, was she aware of his, his spiritual capability? It, it, to me, that doesn't seem probable with the, the explanations of, of what's happening now and that she's realizing that all the uh, material assets that he's given her just are insignificant compared to the treasure of spiritual instruction. So did, did she know all along that he was spiritually evolved or is this just coming to her at, at this time? I think this is a wonderful example of what we're talking about. 
if we remember now, let's go back to our to our previous readings. And how did how did Devahuti even find out about Kardamamuni? Anyone remember? We just heard of him. Adikisha. From whom? Her father. No. Can I, can I, Hare Krishna? Yes. It, 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 yes, I'm. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, Narada Muni. Yes. He uh, was passing through, and he's the one that brings us out of information. Exactly. So that's, so that's the way she knew about him. So there was some indication of his spiritual advancement because Narada Muni had come to the palace of Swayambhuvamanu and spoken about this wonderful sage who was in the forest and who would be a suitable husband for her. Now, what do we also read? What happened when Swayambhuvamanu, Satarupa, and Devahuti came to the hermitage of Kardamamuni? And Swayambhuvamanu and Kardama were talking. And then they, the, the, the discussion came about, about the marriage. And what happened when Devahuti, do you remember the texts? When Devahuti saw Kardama, what happened to her heart? She lost her heart. She yes. said, this is the one. So she must have been also physically attracted to him. It right. wasn't like, okay, I'm going to go and I'll surrender to everything and I'll just go for it because, you know, that's the way it's going to be. No, he, he was, she was also, so, so that mixture of, of, of her heart's aspirations is what, what, what is finally now, after all these years, fulfilling part, part of her material desires, no doubt, um, she's coming to that point where it's no longer satisfying and she's starting to see, oh my God, there's something much better in my husband. And I want to, I want that mm. in our relationship. Mm. But she had a very little realization of this potency when she first, uh, when I she first. So sure. Now that she's okay. been traveling with him okay. and seeing, seeing it, it's like, whoa. It's if by that association, it's it's no longer what she was thinking. It's something grand, grander than that. Thank you. Amrita, anything else? You have to unmute if you want to speak. Just one thing I wanted to comment because hmm. I was hearing from a devotee, um, hot yoga devotee, <laughs> about um, Kate. Our, our taking care of our family. And my understanding is that... Um, by doing our duty and offering it to Krishna, it's a service. So like my service is to make green juice, take care of the garden, make a smoothie, you know, put my daughter's homework up, but that's all my service to Krishna because I'm trying to help myself and these individuals advance in Krishna consciousness. Wonderful. So those same activities that would otherwise bind me can be Correct. helping me to get unbound. That's the so whole then, concept we're talking about, yeah. right? Even though it's, you know, washing dishes or whatever, it's actually sure. devotional service. Again, back to the Bhagavad Gita. It, it, it's so um, profound. Okay, hold on a second. How do I make you a host, uh, Tisha? Unmute and tell me how to make you a host. A host. I'm not sure, but I'll, if I figure it out, I'll let you know. <laughs> okay, let's go on to the next one. Uh, Drew Mahatma, you can yes. click on participants, uh, participants, okay. and you can see the see the list of names. Okay. And then there should be three dots at the bottom of the participants menu. You can, uh, or you actually you can click next to someone's name. Click the three dots, and you okay. can make. Oh, them. and then more. Yeah. Okay. Well, and you, then make host. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to change her. To, to be her host, I just want to add her as host. So you can make her a co-host. I don't see that option. Mm. Not. No. Chat asked to start pen, make host or rename only. Okay, we'll have to work on that later. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Next uh, slide up. And Tisha, who's next? Sorry, Bob. Tata's next. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So I'm reading the purport. Okay. Material achievement is actually no achievement. 
<laughs> because as soon as one is illusioned by the material gifts, he becomes more and more entangled. And there is no question of liberation. One should be intelligent enough to know how to utilize material assets for the purpose of spiritual realization. That is called karma yoga or gyan yoga. Whatever we have, we should use as service to the Supreme Person. It is advised in Bhagavad Gita, Svakarmana Tam Abhyarcha. One should try to worship the Supreme Lord, sorry, the Supreme Personality of Godhead by one's assets. There are many forms of service to the Supreme Lord and anyone can render service unto him according to the best of his ability. Thus ends the Bhaktivedanta purports of the third canto, 23rd chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled Devahuti's Lamentation. So, and in, in, in this verse, it says karma, karma yoga and gyan yoga. Chaitamayi, what, what, what is the difference between bhakti yoga and karma yoga? Um, karma yoga is uh, working in the consciousness that everything you do is, is for Krishna. And uh, bhakti yoga is the, uh, the idea that we are his servants. And, um, but we're looking towards what he wants. Karma yoga, we're still looking towards what we want eventually. There's the desire for some fruit of results. Yes, we offer the results to Krishna, but actually there's, a, how do you say, it's like a sakama. We have, we have an agenda in our, in our work. And what happens to the person who performs his activities in that consciousness, why does why does why does it say in the second canto that verse we studied? Akama sarva kama va moksha kama udara dehtivena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. What happens to the person who's performing karma yoga over time? Um, I think there's still some implication initially. In other words, you might have to come back for more birth, disease, old age, and death. But eventually, in the long run, you realize that. Why am I wanting to keep coming back here? Why do I want to keep performing these fruitive activities? Eventually, the karma yogi will realize there is nothing aside from my service to Krishna. That's the only reality that exists. And therefore, my wanting this material situation <laughs> is not worth investing in. Good. So in a sense, we could say that the practice of that karma yoga gradually purifies the performer right. to the point yeah. where, where, because they start to do something for Krishna. That ingredient is within the recipe. And Beautiful. gradually that will purify the person more and more and more and more to the point where they want to do it in bhakti yoga rather than in karma yoga. Beautiful. Uh, Krishna comes to us wherever we're at. Ah, yes. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Next is Ian. Hare Krishna. Hare Bo. Okay, so 3.24, one to three. Recording the words of Lord Vishnu, the merciful sage Kardama replied as follows to Sri Muva Manu's praiseworthy daughter, Devahuti who was speaking words full of renunciation. The sage said, Do not be disappointed with yourself, O princess. You are actually praiseworthy. The infallible supreme personality of God will surely enter your womb as your son. You have undertaken sacred vows. God will bless you. Hence, you should worship the Lord with great, great faith through sensory control, religious observances, austerities and gifts of your money in charity. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Kardamuni, Kardamamuni encourages wife to be not to be sorry, thinking herself unfortunate because she, the supreme personality of Godhead by his incarnation was going to come from her body in order to spiritually advance or to achieve the mercy of the Lord, one must be self-controlled 
in the following manner. He must be restrained in sense gratification and must follow the rules and regulations of religious principles, religious principles, without austerity and penance and without sacrificing one's riches. One cannot achieve the mercy of the Supreme Lord. Kardama Muni advised his wife, you have to factually engage in devotional service with austerity and penance, following the religious principles and giving charity. Then the Supreme Lord will be pleased with you and he will come as your son. Hare Krishna. So you want to share your realizations about austerity and penance and why it's necessary? Okay, well, uh, austerity and penance will sort of reduce one's, um, sort of one's trying to get satisfaction from, you know, um, material activities. So, you know, austerity of speech, austerity of the mind, you know, you know, all the things you do. So that will um, sort of reduce, you know, your wanting to get some sort of satisfaction from, from material activities. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. They have to be done. They have to be done for the pleasure of Krishna. And the more we absorb, uh, the more one absorbs one's self and simply allowing the senses to dictate or the mind to, to dictate what I should do, why I should do it, then the, 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 you're going further away from the goal. It's, it's like a train going in the wrong direction. Yeah, so I am saying there will be some amount of sense, sensory satisfaction, but in the sense now that we are realizing, you know, just amount, just enough not to, you know, get your, your mind so disturbed. Mm. But sure. initially, ultimately, one should say, you know, my goal, you know, activity. So we get up early in the morning, we do our rounds, attend, you know, morning program, and we have a sort of rhythm of activities. So, yes, there's going to be a little sense control. Nice. But, you know, not as much as previously. But we think, okay, my happiness realizing, you know, material activities. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Arundhati, did you have something you wanted to say? You have your hand up? I actually had a very silly question. I was hoping you could give us some practical examples of the difference between an austerity and a penance, please. Um, austerity is, uh, let's see, an act, generally physical, but not necessarily, where one does something they really don't want to do. It's an austerity. I don't want to do it, but I know it's good for me, so I'll do it. Whereas a penance, there's a bit of a um, understanding of improper activity in the past. And I want to make amends. I want to repent. So therefore penance, my understanding in the word and the concept is that there's some element of not only trying to change whether I want to do it or don't want to do it, but I also understand that it's not good for me and that I've done it in the past, and I want to change that in my future. So therefore, I'm willing to undergo it with some humble attitude in the act that will, that will correct me and purify me as I do it. And by that act of penance uh, and, and repentance, one becomes more properly motivated in their activities. So that's it's combination of the two acting together to elevate uh, one to a higher higher consciousness. Oh, thank you. I'm ready to your hand still um, raised. Did you want some, to add more? You have to unmute. When um, Ian was reading that verse, maybe me realize I had it wrong. So what I was talking about the mode of goodness is actually 714 talking about austerity. And then she just asked you that. So what I was thinking of, because austerity is in the mode of goodness, but then Krishna is mm. telling us how to be austere. The austerity of the body consists of worshiping the Supreme Lord, the Brahman as a spiritual master, the superiors like the father and mother. Cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and nonviolence are austerities of the body. Anyway, 714 to 15, maybe 16, all talks about how to be practice austerity. Like oh, wonderful. Krishna's asking us to practice. But um, 
No, that was it. I think there was something else I wanted to ask or say, but I forgot because I got so like, oh, that was what it was. It wasn't, <laughs> oh, goodness, it was austerity. Oh, no, in Bhagavatam, I think it's the fifth chapter, the 20, the 33rd verse or something, first canto, where Narada Muni is saying to Vyasadeva, isn't it that activity, an activity that causes disease can be also used uh-huh. to cause nice. freedom? Where he's explaining that we take, you know, that's that's karma yoga, right? But it does lead to freedom if we just we offer it to Krishna. He's implying that we can get out of this bondage. Eventually, we learn to love Krishna by offering to him. It becomes bhakti. Right? Good. I'm not remembering the Sanskrit, but I'm remembering the translation. If you know that rhetorical yeah. question that yeah. Narada Muni asked. Yeah, exactly. One th- one thing binds, but that same thing can also be used to liberate. Mm. Okay, I'm going to see if I can take my hand down. Okay. Tisha, next. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to say is oh. in the most lighthearted way, when you, with children or even with pets, if you, um, if they're doing something that you don't want them to do, uh, you don't just tell them to stop doing that thing. Uh-huh. You know, you just like steer them towards doing something else. Like, let's not do this let's kind of you know let's how about we do this now and so when you're talking about penance and austerity it if you like for me I just kind of play that game with my own self with my own mind like yeah maybe I don't want to watch this tv show right now maybe I can you know chant a few more rounds and just try to dub turn my mind towards doing something penance and austerity and when you I I think in my mind, living like at the Ash, living in Alachua or living at a temple when you have um, other people, it kind of steers you along the right path. It helps you. Mm. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Good. Thank you. Perfect example. Very nice. Next. Next to read is Anidati. Dasi, is she still here? Arandati? Yeah. <clears throat> Reading from uh, Srimad Bhagavatam 3.24.4. The personality of Godhead being worshipped by you will spread my name and fame. He will vanquish the knot of your heart by becoming your son and teaching knowledge of Brahman. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Matter and spirit are knotted by false ego. This identification of oneself with matter <clears throat> which is called Ridhya Granti, exists for all conditioned souls, and it becomes more and more tightened when there is too much affection for sex life. The explanation was given by Lord Rishabha to his sons that this material world is an atmosphere of attraction between male and female. That attraction takes the shape of a knot in the heart, and by material affection, it becomes still more tight. For people who hanker after material possessions, <clears throat> society, friendship, and love, this knot of affection becomes very strong. It is only by Brahma Bhavana, the instruction by which spiritual knowledge is enhanced, that the knot in the heart is cut to pieces. No material weapon is needed to cut this knot, but it requires bona fide spiritual instruction. Kardama Muni instructed his wife Devahuti that the Lord would appear as her son and disseminate spiritual knowledge to cut the knot of material identification. It's a perfect, perfect uh, kind of uh, arbringer of what uh, Lord Kapila will offer to humanity. Aranda, do you want to give a little uh, of your share your realizations about the knot and undoing the knot? Uh, I don't know. I just, uh, <laughs> I just feel that this is it's such a, a strong knot, you know, I mean, uh, we have, I personally, I have a spiritual master, he's given me instructions, and um, uh, I, I know his spiritual instructions, all I have to do is just blindly follow his spiritual instructions, that's all I have to do, and his instructions to me are very, very simple, but this knot that uh, I have personally with this. It's so hard. I, I struggle with it every day. So that's my personal reflection on this. Well, I, I think struggle. we can remember that Cardamom Muni had to sit for 10,000 years to yeah. control his mind. So Lord Chaitanya's process of our hearing and chanting and 
you know, for 50, <clears throat> 60, 70 years, we're, we're blessed that we, uh, process is being made. Progress is being made. By the way, who are the beautiful deities in, in this vision? We're seeing deities behind uh, you. They are my Radha Rishikesha. <laughs> Radha Rishikesha. Radha Rishikesha. Beautiful. Yeah. It's glorious. Yeah. Such a sweet smile. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I love They're them. in your home? Yeah. They're at my home. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Beautiful. beautiful. Thank you for sharing them. Yeah. Sham Govinda? Uh, yes, Jim Rajaguru. I did have a question. When I was listening to this week's audio, um, it may have been last week's audio actually, but when uh, Karama Muni was enjoined with Devahuti within the spiritual spaceship that was ever expanding, there's one verse that said they were like effulgent, they were so beautiful, and the maidservants were even more effulgent. And this whole scene just stimulated Karama Muni's sex desire. So the maidservants are unmarried women. Were they also engaged in? so-called sexual activity. I just wanted some clarification because just because I was thinking the maidservants in Mahabharat gave, well, Vidura was born from a maidservant. Um. When, when in Vedic culture, generally when a queen or a princess, when a princess is married, then her there, there are a class of girls called maidservants who go along with her to the husband's palace or abode or to the new kingdom. They serve her, but yes, they also engage some, many, many of them have children with the king. Um, and that's like the perfect example you gave. Vidura was born of one of those Sudranis. She was a, she was a maidservant. It wasn't Amba or Ambalika because they didn't want to come back and have a union again with Vyasadeva. So they sent, they sent their servant and she gave birth to Vidura, and Vidura was still considered the son of Yasadev and the brother of Pandu and Dhritarashtra, but yet he was not qualified, although he was actually qualified, but by birth he wasn't qualified to be the king. So there was some hierarchy of, um, of qualification by birth, even in Vedic culture. So those girls also, my understanding is, yes, they're Made servants of Devahuti, and sure, they may have engaged in um, activities, intimate activities with Kardam. Thank you. Yeah, it doesn't specifically say, so I didn't want to, didn't want to like assume, but so thank you. It's cleared up. Okay. Then <laughs> Samapriya just wrote a note that um, we're talking about the beginning of the universe and populating it as a service to the Lord, as a service to Lord Brahma, who is performing the service for the Lord. And therefore, these prajapatis at the beginning of creation are considered great, greatly powerful sages in that act of population. So to have more and more children was actually a good thing for them, their service. Thank you. Sorry. Next. Faye is next. Faye? Srimad Bhagavatam 3.24.5. Sri Maitreya said, Devahuti was fully faithful and respectful toward the direction of her husband, Kardama, who was one of the Prajapatis or generators of human beings in the universe. O oh, great sage, she thus began to worship the master of the universe, the supreme personality of Godhead, who is situated in everyone's heart. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. One should accept the instruction of the spiritual master of one's life and soul. Whether one is liberated or not liberated, one should execute the instruction of the spiritual master with great faith. It is also stated that the Lord is situated in everyone's heart. One does not have to seek the Lord outside. He is already there. Excuse me. One simply has to concentrate one's worship and good faith. 
as instructed by the bona fide spiritual master and one's efforts will come out successfully. So how does that apply to this particular circumstance with Devahuti <laughs> and what we just read? Devahuti is serving her husband. She is also carrying forth his instructions. She's carrying in forth the instructions of her husband as spiritual master too. Everything points towards Krishna. Everything is always directed towards Krishna. And even sometimes when we can't understand exactly how it works out, the component and essence of faith is to keep on with those instructions, to follow through with determination and humble service. So what was she ordered to do? Do you remember? We just read it in the last verse. Uh, let me turn back okay. to verses one through three. Okay. Sorry, I'm having a, a brain injury day. I'm not okay. tracking very well. Well, it looks like in verse two, it announces that um, she is going to have a son, and the son will be none other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the nine daughters that have come before will be followed by a son. So she is not going to be left in a mode of fear by her husband. Nice. Uh, so we can also say that by well, one of the themes that's, that's uh, gradually evolving is that Cardamom Mamoni gave her instructions, if you remember, we just discussed it, austerity, penance, give away your money in charity, perform these acts, and the Supreme Lord will appear as your son. In other words, worship the Lord, as I'm instructing you, and you will attain the Lord's association. That's the basic formula for the spiritual master and the disciple. Here are the instructions. It's like, a, it's like a, a, an instruction manual. The Vedas are the instructions for man, kind. So coming in a disciplic succession, follow these instructions, do this in your life, and what will be the result? You'll attain the association of the Supreme Lord as a result of following these instructions. Uh, it, the next, the previous verse, verse four, that's the instructions of how that, not in your heart will be finally cut. Mm, nice. Okay, thank you. Got to kind of move along here. Next, Tisha. Is that Manvantara here? Oh, Jai, Manvantara joined. Daddy Bo. Uh, text six. After many, many years, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Madhusudana, the killer of the demon Madhu, having entered the semen of Kardama, appeared in Devahuti, just as fire comes from wood in the sacrifice. Purport. Fire is already present in wood, but by a certain process, the fire is kindled. Similarly, God is all pervading. He is everywhere. And since he may come from everything, come out of from everything, he appeared in his devotee's semen, just as an ordinary living entity takes his birth by taking shelter of the semen of a certain living entity. The Supreme Personality of Godhead accepts the shelter of the semen of his devotee and comes out as his son. This manifests his full independence to act in any way. And it does not mean that he's an ordinary living entity forced to take birth in a certain type of womb. Lord Nishringadev appeared as the pillar of Iranyakshapu's palace. Lord Varaha appeared from the nostril of Brahma. And Lord Kapila appeared from the semen of Kardama. But this does not mean that the nostril of Brahma or the pillar of Iranyakshapu's palace or the semen of Kardam Muni is the source of the appearance of the Lord. The Lord is always the Lord. Bhagavan Madhusudana. He is the killer of all kinds of demons, and he always remains the Lord 
even if he appears as the son of a particular devotee. So one of, one of the themes that we always read about every time we read about the advent of the Lord is that there's a difference between the advent of the Lord and the advent of an ordinary human being or, the, or an ordinary living entity. So Manvantara, how, 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 what is that difference and how is it displayed in this particular circumstance? Krishna, Krishna is, um, what it's saying is that it is Krishna is not an ordinary uh, avatar. I mean, it, it's Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead is not, he, he's not bound to take birth like other living entities. He appears as his will. He's not sanctioned to do it. You know what I mean? So, so I, I, I um, I'm not sure if I'm answering it properly. You are answering so, it properly. You got it exactly right on. Go ahead and expand on it. We're forced, yeah. every single one of us was forced into our body. We had no control over it whatsoever. We ended up in a womb. We took birth and, 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 and that was forced upon us. Right. So is that what's happening to him? Absolutely not. He, he is not forced. Krishna is not forced. I love the way yeah. that Srila Prabhupada presented the purport. He first of all described how the Lord entered the semen of Cardamomoni. Yeah. But then the examples that he gave prove right. that he's free to do anything he wants. Right. Which are? What were the other two examples? Um, the, the nostril of Lord Brahma. Oh, yes. And, um, and the pillar is what he gave as examples in this particular report. Right. But so also, he came as golden hair. And Kardama doesn't have golden hair. Oh, yeah, you put that in your... Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> right, right. right. Yes, yeah, so he's not, he's, not even, he's not even controlled by the genetic code. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Very good. Thank you. Aranditi, your hands raised. I had a question here. Um, when Krishna came as himself in, uh, in Mathura, he, he just appeared. He didn't uh, go through the process of uh, going through Vasudeva's uh, semen and you know being in the womb. But was there any specific reason that this is explained so explicitly here that he goes through Kardama's um, uh, semen? And does he remain in the womb for nine months then? Or is that... Probably not. The daughters appeared the same day, so uh, okay. no telling. That, that, that detail isn't described here. Good point. Good question. Uh, what comes to mind is that in this particular pastime, which is a leela of the Lord in the bigger picture, we have a prajapati, a person who is producing children as a mm -hmm. service to the Lord through semen and, 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 and impregnating his wife. So in order to show that that can be a pure activity, the Lord himself accepted that path. Mm, thank and you. And appeared that way. So it's just, he, that's just to explain it to us that he can do it like that, but he doesn't necessarily, uh, obviously he can supersede it if he wants to. Right? Yes, which we see with Krishna. You gave the perfect example. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next. Okay, next we're back to Amrita. Hi, Krishna. Shrimad Bhagavatam 324, text 7 to 9. Let me just move the screen. Okay. At the time of his descent on earth, demigods in the form of raining clouds sounded music, musical instruments in the sky. The celestial musicians, the Gandharvas, sang the glories of the Lord, while celestial dancing girls known as Apsaras danced in joyful ecstasy. At the time of the Lord's appearance, the demigods flying freely in the sky showered flowers. All, all the directions, all the waters in everyone's mind became very satisfied. Brahma, the firstborn living being, went along with Marichi and the other sages to the place of Kardama's hermitage, which was surrounded by the river Saraswati, Srila Prabhupada's purport. It is learned herewith that in the higher sky, there are living entities who can travel through the air without being hampered. 
Although we can travel in outer space, we are hampered by so many impediments, but they are not. We learn from the pages of Srimad Bhagavatam that the inhabitants of the planet called Sitaloka can travel in space from one planet to another without impediment. They showered flowers on the earth when Lord Kapila, the son of Cardinal, appeared. Any comment on interplanetary travel? You know, I was just, it reminded me of one of Prabhupada's purports. I wish I could tell you where it is, but um, where he says that man thinks they're great because they can make these big airplanes, right? And Prabhupada says, but can they make little tiny ones that can then reproduce more and more? <laughs> you know, like, because like Krishna, he can make these tiny little bugs because man will say, I will go on to the moon. And Prabhupada's saying, yeah, but can he make something so tiny that can then produce more of its own? Mm. You know, like little living entities. That's There's not no what machine, we're reading no about. No machine can reproduce itself. Right. It just reminded me of that, that even though the human beings are trying to um, act like gods, and there's nothing wrong with trying to create for using it for Krishna, but this is important to understand our position, that we are never going to be, and we are not the supreme being. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Next, I'll move along. Next is um, Sham Govinda. He's there. Yes, thank you, uh, Tisha. Shema Bhagavatam 3.24.10. Maitreya continued, O killer of the enemy, the unborn Lord Brahma, who is almost independent in acquiring knowledge, could understand that a portion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in his quality of pure existence had appeared in the womb of Devahuti just to explain the complete state of knowledge known as Sankha Yoga. Purport. Kapila, the son of Karavamuni, in his system of Sankhya philosophy, very explicitly explained not only the material world, but also the spiritual world. Brahma could understand this fact because he is Swarat, almost independent in receiving knowledge. He is called Swarat because he did not go to any school or college to learn, but learned everything from within. Because Brahma is the first living creature within this universe, he had no teacher. His teacher was the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself, who was seated in the heart of every living creature. Brahma acquired knowledge directly from the Supreme Lord within the heart. Therefore, he is sometimes called Swarat and Aja. Any realizations about Lord Brahma's situation? Um... I remember reading in this section that he's called the Adi Kavi. He's the original scholar of the universe. Mm. Um, I, 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 what, what I really ad admire about Lord Brahma is well, just how brilliant it is. he is. He, he's taught directly by the Supreme Personality of Godhead from within. And no one can match him. Well, maybe there are devotees, more powerful devotees than him who have also have the knowledge from within. Um, but yeah, it just parallels how we have two different ways of acquiring knowledge from our senses, and that's how materialists are doing it. And then we also have from our heart uh, through Paramatma and how, how more brilliant that technology is than what we can do from outside. So the power that comes from within, that's always I really admire and appreciate that we just have to look within. Do you know that verse in Bhagavad Gita that describes that process? 1010? 1010? Um, I know 1018, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, conditioned state it's like you know i can feel i'm making some advancement and gaining a little more knowledge when i look at lord brahma he he knows the whole universe he knows everyone he's been instructed direct the vedas came from his mouth i can't i can't it's it's incredible and he's a jiva mm. so the point is the jiva can be enlightened to the point 
even beyond Lord Brahma. Mm. Uh, we're so small and insignificant in our, our, our knowledge. So he understood what's going on here. Um, one point regarding uh, some of the topic we talked about just a few minutes ago, Kapila is in the womb. It was mm. described in this verse that uh, he's in the womb of Devaki. Could understand that a portion of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his quality of pure existence had appeared in the womb of Deva, Devahuti. So Randati, that explains or uh, uh, makes it clear that he is within the womb of Devahuti. Of course, yeah. we don't know. We don't know how long he's going to stay there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Tisha, please. Um, next is Sham Govinda. No, he just read me. I'm next. Yeah. But I have a question. So okay. is uh, Kapila a portion of the Supreme Personality God or is it the full potency of Krishna there taking birth? There are different technological te technical names and nomenclature used to designate different forms of the Lord but they're all similarly potent, just like that example, if you remember the candle. There's the original candle. That candle lights another candle, which would be Balaram. Balaram's the Lord's first expansion. Then you take that second candle, rather than lighting a whole bunch of candles from that first candle, you take the second candle and light four more. That's Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradumna, and Aniruddha. Then you take the Sankarshan from that uh, candle, and light another four, Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradumna, and Ainuru. That's called the second quadruple expansion. These were all explained by Lord Chaitanya to Sanatan Goswami, and they're also fully explained in the different Puranas and Vedas, how the Lord expands unlimitedly. Um, here in the temple this morning, Pundarik Vidyaniti Prabhu gave a really nice uh, class on this topic because Lord Chaitanya was speaking to Sanatan Goswami. We read Chaitanya Charitamrita on Saturdays. And you know how the Lord has four arms and he carries the four different symbols of Vishnu, the club, the lotus, the chakra, and the lotus flower. Let me say four. And depending on which hands those symbols are in, he takes a different name, just like when we say and put on tilak or the different names of the month. All of these expansions of the Lord are the Lord. They're Vishnu tattva, they're not living entities. They're the Lord himself, just like a candle that's been expanded. So one of those expansions we read previously, it's called the Kala. Uh, Kala, a part, is who uh, Lord Kapila Dev is. He's not an empowered living being. He is the Lord. Die. Next. Oh, go ahead. Your turn. Srimad Bhavatam 324, verse 11 and 12. After worshiping the Supreme Lord with gladdened senses and a pure heart for his intended activities as an incarnation, Brahma spoke as follows to Kardama and Devahuti. Lord Brahma said, My dear son, Kardama, since you have completely accepted my instructions without duplicity, showing them proper respect, you have worshiped me properly. Whatever instructions you took from me, you have carried out, and thereby you have honored me. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Brahma praises Kardama because he carried out the orders of the spiritual master in toto and without cheating. A conditioned soul in the material world has the disqualification of cheating. He has four disqualifications. He is sure to commit mistakes. He is sure to be illusioned. He is prone to cheat others and his senses are imperfect. But if one carries out the order of the spiritual master by disciplic succession or the parampara system, he overcomes the four defects. Therefore, knowledge received from the bona fide spiritual master is not cheating. Any other knowledge which is manufactured by the conditioned soul is cheating only. Read the next one too, because it's very similar. Verse 13. Sons ought to render service to their father exactly to this extent. One should obey the command of his father or spiritual master with due 
deference saying, yes, sir. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. As a man cannot separate his life from his body, the disciple cannot separate the order of the spiritual master from his life. If a disciple follows the instructions of the spiritual master in that way, he is sure to become perfect. This is confirmed in the Upanishads. The import of Vedic instruction is revealed automatically only to one who has implicit faith in the Supreme Personality of Godhead and his spiritual master. One may be materially considered an illiterate man, but if he has faith in the spiritual master, as well as in the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then the meaning of scriptural revelation is immediately manifested before him. Now, in the modern world, many people will say, you know, I couldn't do that. I couldn't just bow down and accept another person's instructions in total without, with, you know, it's just not possible. It's not practical. That's why they call it a cult. Because a person, a whole bunch of people follow one person just because that person commands them to do so. That's the kind of objective view of this dynamic. But taking into consideration these disqualifications of conditioned souls, Tisha, explain that a little bit to us. And the difference between the conditioned soul wanting the power to command hundreds and thousands of followers and the disciplic succession and that dynamic of following the instructions. I mean, since we're um, sure to commit mistakes and we're illusioned, then surely we don't know how to serve the Lord or the spiritual master. So we, if you realize that you're you're not qualified to direct yourself, then you know you have to take you have to surrender or or refuge or um, give that to to the Lord or the spiritual master to guide you. It's like when if you're really sick, if you are really sick and you you are told your life is going to end and the doctor tells you if you want to survive, you got to follow these recommendations, take this medicine, eat this food or whatever the doctor recommends, you will do it because your life depends on it. And so you have to look at this the same way. Your life is depending on this. Nice. That was in the next report where it says one can't separate the instructions from the spiritual master uh, to his life. Amrita? Um, I just wanted to, I don't know if it's called adding balance or just something important because where Prabhu is it in the scriptures where we're told that we have to use intelligence and see that our guru is in line with the scriptures. It's like guru, sadhu, shastra. You know, we can't just blindly accept your guru because especially in Kali Yuga, you know, it's hard to find. We're so fortunate if you find a real bona fide guru. And that reminds me about Lord Brahma because he's the most wonderful He's the, you know, most, he was, he, the Vedas came from his mouth, right? So he's like the highest guru, right? But even he, his sons had to tell, tell him, don't chase after our sister. And when he, when he wouldn't listen, they went to Krishna. They went to someone above him, right? And he was like, oh, I felt, did he quit his body? He felt so bad that he even thought about doing that, that he quit his body. But the point is, we can't just blindly go and follow a guru if their instructions don't line up with scripture i'm so well, grateful that, that my that, that's why there's the three it's not right. just guru 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 right. it's guru sadhu and shastra there is checks and balances in a vedic culture there are other sadhus and there is scripture so they have to also all be in line and if the spiritual master says something that doesn't appear to be such then one can directly inquire from him um, how how is this in line? Or if it if it if it's if still not satisfied, go to another sadhu or even find scriptural injunctions. So that's where it's the three. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Tisha, we didn't get Pingala Francois or Pingala Francis to read yet. So maybe we can go to. That's Manvantara. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Oh, I guess you got a different name because we're on a different site. Yes. Okay, I got it. Sorry about that. Can't see very well on the little tiny screen. 
Next is Kate. Hare Krishna, Srimad Bhagavatam 3, 24, 14, 15. Lord Brahma then praised Kardama Muni's nine daughters, saying, All your thin waisted daughters are certainly very chaste. I am sure they will increase this creation by their own descendants in various ways. Therefore, today, please give away your daughters to the foremost of the sages. <laughs> With due respect. Sounds like she's ready. <laughs> With due regard for the girls' temperaments and likings, and thereby spread your fame all over the universe. In the beginning of creation, Brahma was concerned more or less with increasing the population. Sorry. And when he saw that Kardama Muni had already begotten nine nice daughters, he was hopeful that through the daughters, many children would come who would take charge of the creative principle of the material world. He was therefore happy to see them. The nine principal rishis or sages are Marichi, Atri, Angira, Pulastya, Pulaha, Pratu, Brigu, Vaisishta, and Artava, Atharva. All these rishis are most important, and Brahma desired that the nine daughters already born of Kardama Muni must be handed over to them. So connect, connect the two instructions, Kate, or the two things we were just reading, where Lord Brahma has introduced how pleased he is that Karnama followed his instructions. And now he instructs him to give, to give his daughters away to these sages. We'll read later, just in the next upcoming verses, that those sages were actually with him. They had descended from the higher planets. They're all there together. And now, practically speaking, on the spot, Brahma is saying, now give your daughters in charity or give these, give these girls to these sages. How do those two combine the instructions of the spiritual master and uh, life's practical application of it. Um, well, because he was fully surrendered, right? He just took, he is so surrendered that he will give his daughters for the purpose of propagation in service, right? Which, but which, which is a big quite, step. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We wouldn't not just take that instruction from anyone, right? It has to be someone who he who has fully surrendered himself. Right. And... Exactly. And 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 he's like, I just heard the baby. I didn't see her, but um, you know, you're not going to give your daughter away to anybody uh, willy nilly. <laughs> right. has to, there, it's going to be a uh, and the and the more life goes on, the more as we were just discussing, the more um the bond will develop and um vedic culture and the vedic instructions are such that if the culture is followed then the parents feel um satisfied they feel um how do you how do you say safe to give their daughters to someone who is shown to be qualified for their union. Kali Yuga is so degraded that, uh, you know, they have dating sites and uh, horrible ways to try and find um, your soulmate. So it's interesting to see how all of this is unfolding in such a pure way. Thank you. Next. Um, next is Cheta. Hare Krishna. Bhagavatam 314, 16 and 17. Lord Brahma continued, O Kardama, I know that the original Supreme Personality has of Godhead has now appeared as an incarnation by his internal energy. He is the bestower of all that is desired by the living entities. And he has now assumed the body of Kapila Muni. By mystic yoga and the practical application of knowledge from the scriptures, Kapila Muni, who is characterized by his golden hair, his eyes just like lotus petals, and his lotus feet, will bear the marks of lotus flowers, 
plants, which bear the marks of lotus flowers, will uproot the deep-rooted desire for work in this material world. Srila Prabhupada's purport. In this verse, the activities and bodily features of Kapila Muni are very nicely described. The activities of a Kapila Muni are forecast herein. He will be present, sorry, he will present the philosophy of Sankhya in such a way that by studying his philosophy, people will be able to uproot the deep rooted desire for karma, fruit of activities. Everyone in this material world engages in achieving the fruits of his labor. A man tries to be happy by achieving the fruits of his own honest labor, but actually he becomes more and more entangled. One cannot get out of this entanglement unless he has perfect knowledge or devotional service. I um, want, to, want to share a little bit about something that's upcoming. Um, in November and December of 1974, Srila Prabhupada was in the Bombay, at the Bombay Temple when it was being constructed. So from November 1st to December 31st, he lectured every single day on Lord Kapila Dev's teachings to Devahuti. So what I've done is I've gone into that section. Chapter 25 is called The Glories of Devotional Service and chosen 11 successive lectures that, uh, that are the essence of what's going on here. This is a prediction by Lord Brahma of what Lord Kapiladev is doing. What is the mission? The mission is to impart knowledge which will uproot the deeply rooted desire for fruitive activity in this material world. That's why we're here. That's why we were forced into these bodies. So I want everybody to get enthusiastic. We'll study them the last lesson of December, the entire month of January, and the first two, verse, two, two lessons in February. That'll be 11 lectures all together. And during the week, the lessons will just include one verse, its purport, and then the lecture by Srila Prabhupada. And then on the Zoom meetings, we'll go through them and analyze how he lectured on that particular verse. So I'm really looking forward to it. I think everybody will really enjoy it. That sounds great. Yeah, it was, it was really fun doing it. <laughs> wow. So this is chapter 25. You're yes, talking about coming okay. up. I remember uh, Dravida Das saying that this is the uh, Saru Sangastakam of oh. the Bhagavad. Nice. Yeah, all the verses. So I'm excited. A couple, a couple more uh, slides here. Tisha, next. Next is Ian. Ian? I'm here. Okay. Um, just a minute. Okay. So 3.2418 3 to 19. Lord Obama then told Devahuti. My dear daughter, my dear daughter of Manu, the same supreme personality of Godhead who killed him, my cult, Taba, is now within your womb. He will cut off all the knots of your ignorance and doubt. Then he will travel all over the world. Then he will travel all over the world. Your son will be the head of all the perfected souls. He will be approved by the Acharyas, expert in dis disseminating real knowledge, and among the people, he will be celebrated by the name Kapila. As the son of Devahuti, he will increase your fame. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The knot of doubtfulness is tied when the soul identifies with the material world. That knot is also called Ahankar, the junction of matter and spirit. By proper knowledge received from the scriptures in this typical succession, and by proper application of that knowledge, one can free himself from this binding combination of matter and spirit. Brahma assures Devahuti that her son will enlighten her. And after enlightening her, he will travel all over the world distributing the Sistema Sankhya philosophy. Hare Krishna. So, Ian, explain this 
uh, sentence. Read it again and then explain it. I try. So by proper knowledge, we see from the scriptures in this civic succession and by a proper application of that knowledge, one can free himself from this binding combination of matter and spirit. Okay, so by proper knowledge you see from the scriptures in this civic succession. So one has to receive knowledge in this civic succession and by proper application. So not only receiving the knowledge, but uh, proper application of knowledge. One can free himself from this binding combination of matter and spirit. Okay, so um, oh, I see now. Mm. Well, I suppose that says it. <laughs> Uh, you know, by you see, we know receive the knowledge and applying it in proper application. So, what, what's an example um, of, of doing that? What's an example of receiving mm, knowledge and the practical or proper application of that knowledge? Mm, Lord Chaitanya came and yes. gave, some, gave some knowledge. What was that? What uh, was that knowledge? What did he explain to do? Uh, not sure I get you. Lord Chaitanya explained the process of self-realization in this age is? Oh, by chanting the, the Maha Mantra. Okay, so that's the knowledge. And how does one practically apply it? I, so by regular, I suppose, by regular. Um, by chanting. By, by chanting, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Okay, right. yeah. Perfect. Yes. So yeah. Receiving, receiving knowledge from, and, and then what does Prabhupada say? Molding one's life. Mm. Yes. Mm. Making it part yes. of your life. I, I receive this knowledge, now I'll make it part of my life by doing it, and then yeah. I become freed from this knot. Jai, thank you. One okay, more. Hare Krishna. Jai, Hare Krishna. Tisha? Um, Arundhati is next, then she has her hand up. Oh, okay. Arundhati? Yeah, I, before I, I go on to this, I, I've had this, you know, this burning question for a while. I did uh, Ayurveda, the level one, which was like the basic level. And in that, they have these different sages who've done different things. And in that, they have a Kapil Dev who speaks about Sankhya philosophy. And my, I was totally mind boggled when I read about that. And now when we are doing this course here, I'm looking at this, this wonderful example of how Krishna takes the trouble to come as Kapil Dev mm. and then to go around spreading Sankhya philosophy. So why do we have this, this flip version of Kapila teaching the absolute nonsense, you know, because the Ayurvedic doctors, the ones who are absolutely, you know, are so well versed, they will not even want to hear about the actual Kapil there because they're like, oh, no, 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 you keep your Hare Krishna out of this. We, this is not about religion. It's all about science and stuff like that. It's mind boggling that we would have uh, two sides of the coins which are so dramatically different. Yes, it is. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's the uh, ultimate trick of the illusion to make them think that they, they have full knowledge. Uh, the, 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 the Maya energy, the Mayak energy is so powerful that it can actually give one full intelligence of how God doesn't exist. Full intelligence, big scientists, PhDs, they can get together and uh, talk for ages about the material world and it's all its different features and difficult, you know, it's like that example of a banyan tree. The banyan tree, the unique feature is it goes down in the earth, then it comes back up, then it goes down the earth, then it comes back up, it's like never ending. So when, when Krishna gives that example in Bhagavad Gita, that this material world is like the banyan tree. It's upside down. It's a reflection of the spiritual world. And one lives in the reflected world covered by a hunkar or false ego and thinks that it's reality. So even within that network of illusion, there's another person that manifested and was born and became a scientist and expounded almost the same exact information as the Kapila Dev that the Lord did but he didn't explain anything about the spiritual world. That's the main difference between the two philosophies. One is simply like the Buddhist philosophy that this material energy is all that exists. Whereas Kapila Dev that we're reading about explained also about the spiritual world. Another nice example is Darwin. Darwin got, got the, the gist of the evolution of the different species. 
right? From the lower, from the non-moving living, the microbes and the and then the aquatics, and then they come out of the out of the water. You see the pictures of the of the lower entities gradually coming to the human form of life, and it appears like it's a reality because that's the evolution of species. But what he doesn't get or didn't present was that it's the soul that's migrating through different bodies to come to higher consciousness. He presented it that it was the actual species that are evolving, but it's not. It's the soul evolving through them. So the illusion is really sublime and, and good in creating this so-called reality and information. Wow. Crazy. So we should consider ourselves really, really lucky, you know, oh. the handful of us that we've managed to get away from all these illusory uh, intellectual intel intelligentsia, as they call it, and you know, managed to come into <laughs> into the sadhu sangha. <laughs> I think and, you and, really and don't don't, don't you find that by by reading and studying and associating with devotees, it's so much more satisfying and real <clears throat> and long lasting and eternal rather than something that's simply binding and um, yeah. cyclic. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to the last, this is the last slide for today. Yeah. Uh, SB 324, 20 to 25, Sri said, after thus speaking to Kardama Muni and his wife Devahuti, Lord Brahma, the creator of the universe, who is also known as Hamsa, went back to the highest of the three planetary systems on a swan carrier with the four Kumaras and Narada. O Vidura, after the departure of Brahma, Kardama Muni, having been ordered by Brahma, handed over his nine daughters as instructed to the nine great sages who created the population of the world. Kardama Muni handed over his daughter Kala to Marichi and another daughter Anasuya to Atri. He delivered Shraddha to Angira and Havirbhu to Pulastya. He delivered Gati to Pullaha and chased Kriya to Kratu, Khyati to Brugu and Arundhati to Vashishta. He delivered Shanti to Atharva. Because of Shanti, sacrificial ceremonies are well performed. Thus he got the foremost Brahmanas married and he maintained them along with his wives. Thus married, the sages took leave of Kardama and departed full of joy, each for his own hermitage of Vadura. So this ends the, well, the, the sort of like the uh, theme of Devahuti and Kardama and their daughters. And we'll go on to um, Lord Kapiladev's pastimes with his parents uh, in the future. Any more questions or comments? Thank you very Hare much, Krishna. everyone. Hare Krishna. Hare yeah. Krishna. Oh, yes. I, I just really appreciate your brilliant synopsis of uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. I've never heard it explained like that. Oh, good. Thank you so much thank for that you. insight. Yes. Uh, okay, thank you. Bunch of copper to be Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you. 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 Thank you.